Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar sponsored by the North American Vascular Biology Organization. I'm Linda Shapiro from the University of Connecticut and a member of the NAVBO Education Committee. I will be moderating today's session. We are quite pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Tim Hua of Boston Children's Hospital, who will present his work entitled Sphingosine 1-Phosphate Signaling from the Receptor and Signaling Mechanisms to Novel Therapeutics. The presentation will cover the history, background, and current research on sphingosine 1-phosphate biology. Today's webinar is being supported by the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research at the University of Toronto. Before we get started, I would wanted to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout this webinar, you're able to switch between the phone audio and the computer audio in case you're having a problem. You can see this information on the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience technical problems, please click on the Help tab at the top of the control panel. Scroll to the bottom of the Help screen for the technical support phone number. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Vivian Lee from Boston Children's Hospital, who will monitor today's questions. We'll handle questions in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box on the control panel. Dr. Lee will compile and then pose the questions to Dr. Hla at the end of the presentation. At the end of the question and answer period, if there is time, attendees will be able to ask any additional questions by raising your hand by clicking the hand icon in the left hand side of your control panel. You will be recognized and your mic will be unmuted and you'll be then be able to ask your question live. This webinar is being recorded and archived on the NAVBA website for future use. Dr. Law is an investigator at the Vascular Biology Program at Boston Children's Hospital and the Pat Patricia K. Donahoe Professor of Surgery at the Harvard Medical School. He's contributed widely to the areas of sphingosine 1-phosphate signaling, cyclooxygenase 2, the COX-2 pathway, and vascular cell and molecular biology. Please welcome Dr. Law. Uh, thank you, uh, Linda. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at this NAVBO webinar uh, in which uh, I will uh, discuss our research uh, on S1P, sphingosine 1-phosphate signaling. Um, the next slide shows um, disclosures, um, potential conflicts of interest as required by my university. And so I'll go to the next slide which uh, discusses the outline of the talk. Um, the first topic I'd like to discuss today is to introduce you to uh, S1P metabolism and S1P signaling um, background. Um, so, and also, but before I do that, I'd like to um, um, give you a, a historical anecdote on how my lab entered this area. Um, many years ago, when I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in Tom Masiak's laboratory, um, I was interested in cloning uh, genes involved in the transition of the quiescent endothelium into an activated angiogenic endothelium. So I took human endothelial cells, as you can see on this uh, photomicrograph on the top left of your screen. Uh, these are HUVEX, or human umbilical vein endothelial cells, grown on collagen gels so that they have the right extracellular matrix Q. And then they were treated with fovel ester, fovel meristic acid, or PMA. And as it was shown previously uh, by many uh, scientists at the time, um, when protein kinase C, or PKC, is activated, uh, endothelial cells migrate, uh, invade the matrix, and organize into capillary-like networks, which are shown in the panel D. Um, so I use this system to look for genes that are induced uh, during this process of angiogenic activation. And one of the first genes isolated was um, uh, an orphan G protein couple receptor. In other words, it was an unknown G protein couple receptor 
uh, whose ligand we did not know about. Um, the characteristic of this GPCR, which we termed as EDGE1, or endothelial differentiation gene 1, was that its message was expressed at very high levels. It was very abundant. And secondly, it was induced not only by PMA, but also by um, other angiogenic factors, such as fibroblast growth factor, or FGF. So we decided to study that further. Uh, when I started my lab, uh, I was fortunate enough that NIH funded this project with an orphan receptor um, RFA, and that allowed us to de-orphan this receptor, which took many years. But using a HEK293 cell transfection assay, which is shown in the lower left corner, where you can see that in panel B, uh, EDGE1 transfected HEK293 cells in the presence of serum formed um, networks. And these are cell aggregates in which cell-cell uh, adherence junctions allowed uh, organization of these structures. And we found that this uh, differentiation was ligand dependent. In other words, it was dependent on a lipid present in serum. Using this as an assay, we determine S1P is a, is a ligand uh, for the G protein couple receptor EDGE1. Um, and that was how our, my laboratory started working on uh, sphingolipids, which were poorly understood as signaling bioactive lipids at the time. Um, fast forward about 20 years, and we know quite a bit about S1P signaling. The structure of S1P is shown uh, in this cartoon um, in the top left corner. Um, it's a stable bioactive lipid with a unique structure. It has both positive charge from the amino group and a negative charge from the phosphate group um, uh, in physiological conditions. Um, and it is poorly water soluble. So here's a very stable uh, lysophospholipid mediator, much more stable than prostaglandins, for example, uh, that is not water soluble. And we now know that S1P is produced from the, inside the cells. Um, on the top right, you see a picture of a cell membrane uh, inner leaflet of the cell membrane has a substrate, uh, sphingomyelin, which is hydrolyzed by the sphingomyelinase pathway to form S1P, which is then um, exported by specific transporters. In this case, we've uh, labeled Spinster 2 or SBNS2. That allows flipping of S1P from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet uh, of the cell membrane. And this can happen in many, many cells in the body. Um, and uh, because it is, this lipid is not water soluble, proteins have to extract this lipid from the cell membrane so that they can be transported in the extracellular milieu. And in plasma, we know that there are uh, S1P carriers such as albumin. In addition, um, apolipoprotein M or APOM on high-density lipoprotein or HDL particle are S1P carriers. In mammalian plasma, there's about one micromole of S1P, so it's quite abundant. And the, um, the carrier proteins present the lipid mediator S1P to its receptors, and we now know that there are five receptors, S1P1 to S1P5. These are related G protein couple receptors. Uh, S1P1 is EDGE1, uh, the gene that we cloned. Um, and these, all these receptors bind to the ligand S1P uh, with a high affinity. Dissociation constant it is estimated to be in 10 to 50 nanomolar range. The binding of the ligand to the receptor 
leads to activation of heterotrimeric G proteins, such as GI, G1213, and GQ. Uh, we know um, a lot about the redundancy and uh, specificity of these five receptor subtypes interacting with the heterotrimeric G proteins and downstream of the heterotrimeric G proteins, both alpha and beta gamma subunits are well-known uh, cellular signal transduction pathways uh, such as key mediators RAS pathway, PI3 kinase pathway, phospholipase C or PLC pathway, uh, small GTPase, Rho and RAC pathways, and calcium pathway. An interaction of those leads to cellular changes such as proliferation, survival, migration, cytoskeletal changes in the endothelium. Um, many things happen, uh, including vasorelaxation and vasoconstriction. Um, one characteristic of this lysolipid uh, mediator is that it is a homeostatic lipid mediator. There's quite a bit of S1P under normal conditions and widely uh, present in, um, in evolution, particularly in vertebrates. Uh, so blood plasma uh, and lymph plasma has micromolar concentrations of S1P, Presum um, presumably because there are cells that have the high capacity production and release of S1P, such as erythrocytes, endothelium in, in both the blood cells and lymphatic system, and um, blood system and the lymphatic system. Um, in contrast, the S1P concentrations in the interstitial fluids is extremely low. Uh, is estimated to be in the nanomolar range. Uh, and that is presumably because of high activity of the uh, S1P lyase, which, uh, which is a degradative enzyme. Uh, so there is a gradient of S1P in the circulatory system and the extra uh, circulatory tissues. Uh, and that is called S1P gradient and this gradient is very important in the function of both vascular and immune systems. The next topic I'd like to discuss is what we know about the role of S1P in vascular formation or angiogenesis, vascular development uh, in vertebrates, uh, and vascular homeostasis in physiology, and its involvement in diseases, vascular diseases. Um, the genetic evidence that EDGE1 or S1P receptor 1 is critical for vascular development was provided by Richard Proria's lab. Uh, this paper was published almost two decades ago. We collaborated with Rick. Um, and what Rick showed was that in the absence of this major S1P receptor, um, vascular endothelial cells that undergo angiogenesis uh, become unstable, hemorrhagic, uh, the barrier function is lost, so one sees edema in the knockout embryo, which is shown on the right, and leads to mid-gestational uh, embryonic lethality. Um, so vascular maturation during embryogenesis requires the S1P receptor 1. Um, and further studies in our lab, uh, which is illustrated here, show that S1P receptor 1 expression in the endothelium is critical for uh, the stability of the primary vascular network. So if you delete S1P receptor 1 postnatally uh, with a inducible um, knockout model, tissue-specific knockout or global knockout model, uh, and analyze the developing endothelium in the retina, which is shown here. Uh, the knockout, which is shown on the right side, compared to the wild type, which is shown on the left, the knockout uh, vasculature shows hypersprouting uh, vascular network that is very dense with increased number of tip cells. 
And this phenotype, although it resembles a, a notch receptor um, uh, loss of function mice, uh, is notch independent, uh, which we show subsequently. And secondly, if you overexpress uh, S1PR1 in an inducible transgenic model, you can see that the GOF of gain of function, which is a transgenic for S1PR1, which is in the lower panel C and D, um, and you, uh, you see that, that vascular density of that network is less than uh, the wild type counterparts. In addition, on the right, you can appreciate that tip cell numbers are reduced, branch points are reduced. So precise uh, expression of S1PR1 in the developing vasculature is critical for normal angiogenesis. And this is illustrated in this cartoon, uh, which was described in detail in our paper in developmental cell in 2012. And I should also mention that two papers were published concurrently, which came to the same conclusion. And that is that S1PR1 is induced in the, its expression is induced in the more mature vascular networks, whereas uh, its expression is minimal in the vascular sprouts. Um, and this is presumably due to flow dependent mechanisms. And in addition, uh, the function of S1PR1, which is uh, promoted by the circulating S1P um, from the blood, uh, leads to cessation of sprouting, which is induced by hypoxia-induced growth factors such as VEGF. So, the, so we think of it as S1P finishes what VEGF starts, in formation of a primary vascular network. And this, we think, is a fundamental mechanism in many contexts of uh, angiogenesis in both uh, physiology and disease. Um, we also showed um, earlier in an adult model of angiogenesis using growth factor impregnated matrigel model that in the presence of S1P supplementation in the matrigel, the vessels that are formed in, in response to growth factors such as FGF or BEGF become mature, they become invested with pericytes and um, allow uh, efficient circulation as shown in this uh, transmission electron micrographs. To summarize a lot of that data from our lab as well as many other laboratories, um, the data supports a model where uh, S1PR1, collaboration with other S1P receptors, particularly two and three, in the endothelium, uh, leads to proper adherence junction assembly, uh, proper um, matrix um, binding to integrins, and, and stable uh, focal adhesion assembly, and therefore leads to stable flow competent vessels. Um, and this can be illustrated uh, in this photo photograph on the right side, which is an experiment where S1PR1 is deleted in the adult using an inducible knockout model. Uh, you can appreciate the lungs become extremely permeable to Evans Blue, uh, which is um, bound to albumin uh, because the adherence junctions become uh, dysfunctional and the capillaries in the lung become leaky. Notice that you don't see that um, phenotype in the brain where the um, capillaries are uh, endowed with uh, tight junctions. In the brain, in contrast, uh, if you use a smaller tracer, in this case, we use uh, cadaverine, which is one kilodalton. You can see uh, high level uh, BBB, a blood brain barrier permeability of uh, cadaverine into the brain in the S1PR1 endothelial specific knockout. So, in the adult, 
S1PR1 function is critical for barrier function under normal conditions. In addition, in the uh, adult, uh, in mice, S1PR1 function in the arterial uh, vasculature is critical for nitric oxide activation. In the endothelial cell ECKO, uh, uh, or endothelial specific knockout, uh, phosphoenos, which is shown in the uh, two lower panels, wild type and knockout, uh, phosphoenos positive cells uh, in both intensity and number are decreased, uh, which suggests that um, absence of e uh, S1PR1 in the endothelium leads to lower nitric oxide activity, which is um, nitric oxide synthase activity, which is reflected when one measures plasma nitrite, as shown on the right, uh, as well as its uh, physiological surrogate, which is uh, systolic blood pressure. In the knockout, uh, two or three weeks later after gene deletion, you can see significant elevation in systolic blood pressure. So we believe that in the arterial system, uh, S1PR1 in the adult is critical for blood flow uh, and vascular tone control. Um, in addition, deletion of S1PR1 leads to inflammatory responses. So in other words, we think that S1PR1, um, its homeo one of its homeostatic functions is to inhibit uh, inflammation. As you can see, the knockout shows enhanced expression of uh, leukocyte adhesion molecules, VCAM1 and ICAM1, in, in um, for example, descending aorta in the knockout, which is shown on the right side, um, which supports the idea that this is an anti-inflammatory endothelial GPCR. And if you cross these mice to um, uh, APOE knockout and feed these mice high-fat diet, uh, atherosclerotic plaque formation is increased. And these data suggest that S1PR1 uh, in the endothelium is critical for uh, inhibiting vascular inflammation and is a negative factor for atherosclerosis development in mouse models. Um, so while we were doing much of these studies in, um, in, um, in the vascular system, there was a serendipitous development uh, in the immunology area. And that uh, started out with the medicinal chemistry of this old Chinese uh, fungal medicine, um, which is isolated from this fungus, Isaria sinclairi, um, that the compound is an immunosuppressant or immunomodulator. And Suzanne Mandela, who was at, at Merck at the time, um, discovered that FTY720, which is a compound originally with its origins in Azaria sinclairi, is a sphingosine analog, gets phosphorylated, and acts on S1P receptors as a functional antagonist. Um, and um, a lot of work summarized here, primarily from Jason Sister's laboratory at UCSF, and as, as well as many others, show that um, T cells uh, that uh, home into lymph nodes, which would be secondary lymphoid organs, uh, would have low levels of interstitial S1P, uh, uses the S1PR1 on the immune cells to sense the gradient uh, which and, and egress into the lymphatic system. And if you block the receptor with fingolimod or FTY720, that leads to um, internalization of the receptor and inhibition of T cell egress. So this was shown uh, in, in, in clinical trials to be effective in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. Um, 
This is a schematic taken from a review by Uli von Andrian, uh, which describes that, again, that the egress of autoreactive T cells from lymph nodes uh, requires S1PR1. And if you block that with this compound, uh, Colfingolamod, Gelenia, or FTY720, uh, it leads to the inhibition of T cell egress and therefore less of an ability of the autoreactive immune cell to infiltrate the uh, diseased uh, organ and therefore reduce progression of autoimmune disease. In this case, it will be multiple sclerosis or relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. FTY720 treatment in humans was shown to be effective in the treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis, and it was approved by the FDA uh, in 2010. Um, now, uh, there are several um, S1PR1 functional antagonists um, being tested in clinical trials for many autoimmune diseases, such as uh, progressive forms of multiple sclerosis, ulcerative colitis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, and so on. So targeting lymphocyte S1P receptor 1 has appeared to be useful clinically, and this area has entered the clinical uh, arena since 2010. Now these, uh, as you know, the fingolimod is a small molecule that has, in addition to efficacy, uh, substantial adverse events, which are vascular related. Um, the mechanism of action um, of fingolimod and other small molecule S1P receptor um, uh, functional antagonists uh, were worked out by many laboratories, including our own, and, and is summarized here. S1B receptor one, uh, as many uh, GPCRs, after binding to the ligand, is internalized through clathrin-coated vesicles. Um, and if the, the ligand is a physiological S1P, the uh, ligand dissociates in the late endosomes and the receptor recycles. If, however, the pharmacological agent, FTY720 phosphate, um, poorly dissociates and causes sustained uh, activation of the receptor, or irreversible endocytosis, ubiquitination, and degradation. And the irreversible endocytosis of the receptor uh, is the mechanism by which uh, this agent leads to uh, antagonism of the receptor in the secondary lymphoid organs. Um, we showed this using a knock-in model. Um, we showed uh, several years ago that the C-terminus of S1B receptor 1 is phosphorylated. Uh, there's a serine-rich cluster, and we changed the five serines to alanine so that this mutant is no longer phosphorylated. We call that the S5A mutant. And as, as you can see in this um, photomicrograph, it's a confocal photomicrograph of HEK293 cells expressing um, S1PR1 wild type or mutant, and both are tagged with GFP. On the left, uh, in the presence of vehicle, the receptor is on the cell surface, and both S1P or FTYP treatment for 30 to 60 minutes leads to endocytosis of the wild type receptor but not the mutant receptor. Um, since it shows um, uh, resistance to ligand and drug-induced uh, endocytosis, we made a mutant knock-in mouse. And uh, in the knock-in mouse, we can also show that the kinetics of internalization of S1PR1 on T cells is uh, inhibited. It is slowed down by, by this mutation. Um, so the S5A mutant in the middle flow panel, you can see that at two hours post-drug treatment, the S1PR1 cell surface expression is not altered, 
whereas in the wild type, which is shown in the left panel, it is. Uh, however, at 24 hours, both wild type and mutant show internalization. And the mutant mice show delayed kinetics uh, of FTY-induced lymphopenia. Uh, if the mice were dosed with a single dose, which is clinically relevant dose of FTY-720 at time zero, while wild-type mice show complete lymphopenia at, at two hours, which is sustained for 120 hours, the mutant mice uh, show delayed kinetics of lymphopenia and rapid rebound suggesting that the presence of S1PR1 on the cell surface allows efficient egress of uh, the mutant um, uh, T cells uh, shortly after the drug levels decline. And therefore, plasma membrane residency of S1PR1 on immune cells is a key determinant by which the, the immune cells decide whether to stay in a, go, go from a low S1P environment to a high S1P environment, i.e. from a lymph node into the lymph. The, so the next topic that I'd like to talk about is S1P chaperones, which I've already introduced briefly in my uh, introduction. And that's a concept that we've been working on in the last uh, five or six years. Um, as I mentioned previously, S1P, even though it's quite stable, it's um, poorly water soluble. And if one takes mammalian plasma, either human or mouse or rat, um, most of the S1P is found in the HDL fraction. Uh, so two-thirds is found on HDL and about a third on the albumin fraction. Uh, the reason why it is specifically associated with HDL and not other lipoproteins is not known uh, at the time. Um, and the specificity of, of HDL versus albumin, albumin which is a much more abundant protein, uh, only has a third, whereas HDL, which is a lot lower in abundance, has much higher S1P levels, is also not known. Um, in uh, about in 2010, 2011 time period, we collaborated with Jan Dahlbeck in Sweden. Uh, Hideru Obinata, who's, um, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, um, initiated that um, or led the, led the uh, collaboration with uh, Dr. Dahlbeck's laboratory and showed that APOM is the reason why S1P is bound to HDL. So the data are that if you purify human HDL into APOM containing or non-APOM containing fractions, um, all of the S1P is associated with APOM plus HDL. Um, APOM plus HDL is only about 5% of total HDL population in normal individuals. Um, and this population shows great variation among individuals and also in individuals with various disease conditions. If you take mouse plasma, wild type is shown in the top panel, uh, fractionated on FPLC, you, S1P, which is the red uh, peaks, um, which is determined by uh, LCMS, uh, is seen in two peaks. Uh, the large peak corresponds to the HDL peak, that's two-third, and the smaller peak is the albumin peak, or the uh, lipoprotein-free S1P. And that peak is the same, or, whereas the lipoprotein-associated S1P is uh, absent in APOM knockout plasma, whereas in APOM transgenic plasma, that fraction is increased. In addition, Beyond's lab uh, co uh, solved the close crystal structure of S1P bound APOM, which is shown here. It's a calyx-like structure, um, which looks like a coffee cup, and S1P is shown um, uh, buried in the ligand binding pocket of this lipocalin uh, family of protein. This is APOM. The entire APOM is tethered 
uh, in the HDL particle by the N-terminal signal peptide, which is retained and not cleaved in this HDL uh, protein. Um, so to summarize a lot of what we know about APOM and albumin bond S1P, um, the data support the model that HDL bond S1P is a biased agonist on endothelial S1PR1. In other words, um, the model of HDL is shown in the lower right corner. The APOM structure is shown as a uh, calyx-like protein on the top. We believe that the, the HDL particle docks on the cell surface, presumably due to binding to HDL binding proteins such as SRB1 or ABCA1 or G1, and brings the APOM molecule to close proximity of S1P1 receptor, which is shown on the top. Uh, that's where the ligand exchange takes place and receptor activation takes place. If S1P receptor 1 is activated by the uh, APOM bound S1P or HDL bound S1P, we see strong activation of MAP kinase or ERK um, and strong inhibition of cytokine-induced NF-kappa B, uh, whereas albumin bound S1P does not have the ability to potently inhibit cytokine-induced NF-kappa B. In contrast, uh, albumin bound S1P strongly induces uh, receptor endocytosis and strongly downregulates intracellular cyclic EMP levels, while the action on the MAP kinase is equivalent between the two chaperones. So this type of bias signaling by various chaperones results in different functional outcomes. For example, the barrier function, uh, inflammatory suppression in the endothelium, and promotion of normal homeostasis of the vasculature are potently promoted by HDL bound S1P, whereas um, um, in the lymphocytes, uh, the APOM bound S1P uh, is, is involved in suppression of lymphopoiesis in the bone marrow. Uh, so the bias signaling by various chaperones may provide specificity of S1P signals in different physiological and pathological contexts. Uh, here's um, some data um, by which some of these models were derived from. Uh, when endothelial cells are treated with a TNF, adhesion molecule ICAM1 is strongly induced. Uh, APOM plus HDL, which is shown in the top, uh, in the bottom right corner, um, it will suppress that, whereas APOM minus HDL, which is shown on the left lower panel, is not as effective, and neither is albumin bond S1P, which is shown on the top. So once we know that um, chaperones are important in suppressing uh, vascular inflammation, vascular disease, and promoting vascular homeostasis. Uh, the question is, is this pathway limiting and therefore therapeutically useful? Um, there's data in the literature uh, that suggests that the S1P and APOM content in HGL is limiting in several pathological conditions. For example, in sepsis and septic shock in both uh, rodents, uh, non-human primates, and humans, uh, S1B levels decrease, APOM levels decrease, um, and uh, HDL bond S1B is decreased. Uh, this is also seen in diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and in, uh, some, uh, in, in some cases of coronary artery disease, particularly acute coronary syndromes. So we developed um, a therapeutic strategy to potentially solve this problem, and that is to make a soluble APOM molecule that is stable to deliver S1P 
um, in, selectively to the vascular receptors. Um, as you know, the small molecule S1P are one targeted agents, both agonists and functional antagonists um, have adverse events uh, in the vascular system because they tend to induce internalization of the receptor. Uh, we know that HDL bond S1P is very poor in terms of inducing endocytosis. Um, and in addition, APOM keeps the S1P quite stable. So we fuse the APOM molecule with a FC domain of immunoglobulin G um, and uh, we call it APOM FC. We also uh, design a mutant which we can use as a control. Uh, so here is a crystal structure of APOM. We know that the three residues, arginines, two arginines and a tryptophan are critical for coordinating the phosphate moiety of S1P molecule. So we made an alanine um, mutant, uh, we call it triple mutant, APOM, which will not have the ability to bind to S1P at high affinity. Um, we purified APOM and APOM, APOM FC and APOM FC triple mutant in uh, recombinant systems in the lab and purified, developed a method to purify it to homogeneity as shown here in the Kumasi stain gel on the right. And we show that uh, APOM FC has the ability to bind S1P at high capacity, but APOM FC triple mutant does not. Um, uh, in this uh, method that we use, we can load uh, APOM FC to about 50% capacity with S1P. And um, what we show is that in vitro, in, in endothelial cell barrier function assays, where we can measure transendothelial resistance, <clears throat> which is a function of adherence junctions and focal adhesions, uh, it's known that albumin S1P would induce transient increase in endothelial barrier function, uh, which is shown with the blue line. Uh, what we find is that APOM FC loaded with S1P has a much more sustained effects in terms of promoting vascular barrier function and triple mutant is inactive. And this is due to the activation of S1P receptor one because in endothelial cells in which receptor one is knocked out by CRISPR-Cas9, this effect is attenuated. The APOM FC molecule and both triple mutant and wild type are highly stable in vivo. Half life in mice was estimated to be about 90 hours. This is after IP or intraperitoneal administration. So we use that in several models. The first question we asked was whether APOM FC treatment um, was different than small molecule S1P receptor uh, one um, targeted agents like FTY720 in terms of inducing lymphopenia. As shown in this slide, we find that APOM FC treatment does not induce lymphopenia. We think that um, once, if you administer this agent IP or IV, it doesn't access the lymphocyte receptors uh, and induce endocytosis of the lymphocyte receptors in the secondary lymphoid organs and therefore um, does not induce lymphopenia and therefore achieves vascular selectivity. Um, we used a model of ischemia reperfusion injury in the heart uh, fall, uh, induced by left anterior descending coronary LAD a coronary artery ligation model. Um, in previous studies shown here in both mice and pig models of cardiac ischemia reperfusion injury, S1P receptor agonist was shown to be efficacious in reducing um, uh, myocardial injury uh, in part due to protection of the vulnerable endothelium following ischemia reperfusion injury and in part by suppressing inflammation. Um, uh, 
we used a um, mouse LED model, and 24 hours later, as shown in this slide, we can show that ApoMFC treatment, but not the triple mutant, leads to reduction in myocardial infarct size. Um, and a week or two weeks later, actually, we also lo looked at immune cell uh, infiltration um, and neutrophil infiltration was substantially reduced by ApoMFC following ischemia reperfusion injury. And a week or two weeks later, cardiac function is significantly improved uh, following ApoMFC treatment in the LAD model of ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, in addition, this pathway has been uh, uh, pursued uh, with uh, interest in cerebral uh, ischemia reperfusion injury um, uh, pathology in, in stroke and other um, cerebrovascular diseases. Um, these papers describe previous work from other laboratories in both uh, animal models as well as in a preliminary clinical trial, phase one trial in humans of using S1PR agonists uh, to try to salvage the vulnerable endothelium and achieve neuroprotection following stroke. Um, we we use the middle cerebral artery occlusion model or MCAO model of stroke in mice uh, in collaboration with Teresa Sanchez, who's at Wild Cornell Medicine. And uh, Teresa's lab uh, in a blinded study showed that ApoMFC treatment following MCO ligation and reperfusion. So this is a treatment regimen, not a prevention regimen in a treatment uh, regimen was able to reduce uh, uh, infarct size in the brain, uh, which is indicated by the white areas in these brain sections on the right. The triple mutant, it was much more effective than the triple mutant or vehicle control, and the quantification is shown here. And both uh, cerebral edema and infarct size are reduced significantly by ApoMFC treatment following stroke, MCO stroke. So these data, uh, I believe, allow us to conclude that S1P signaling via its GPCRs in various cell types mediates uh, critical functions in both vascular and hematopoietic systems. Um, I talked uh, a bit about uh, not only the basic work that we've done and others have done, but also a clinical application of this work in various autoimmune diseases uh, that, um, that has uh, excitement and benefits, but also challenges in terms of adverse events, and which justifies <coughs> a lot of the basic studies. Um, we've, I've shown you data about HDL-S1P. <coughs> It promotes specific biological functions of S1P. It signals via endothelial S1PR1 to promote homeostasis and inhibits inflammation. <coughs> and we believe that HDL S1P that's circulating, uh, activation of endothelial S1P receptors, that's an important homeostatic circuit to keep the vasculature healthy uh, under normal conditions. And uh, this pathway may be therapeutically tractable. And we have shown you some data on uh, ApoMFC that we developed uh, and, and are developing for further um, potential clinical and translational applications uh, to activate uh, vascular S1P receptors in a sustained manner. Uh, we showed that ApoMFC showed efficacy in mouse models of myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury and middle cerebral artery occlusion model of stroke. And therefore, we'd like to suggest that chaperone-dependent S1P signaling provides new avenues for therapeutic development in vascular and inflammatory diseases, um, which is in addition to the small molecule strategies that uh, various uh, companies and academic labs are pursuing. 
Uh, so that's the end of my talk, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my um, um, lab members who did all this work uh, in, in collaboration with uh, many other labs around the world. In particular, I'd like to point out the work of Steve Swindeman, who is a senior research associate. He worked on APOMSC. Silvan Galvani and Hideru Obinata worked on uh, APOM S1P and um, uh, HDL S1P. Uh, Dr. Obinata is now an associate professor back in Japan in his own lab. Uh, Yutran Chong, who was a postdoc at the time, he's currently a senior scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, worked on the ischemia reperfusion models in the heart. I'd like to acknowledge MUSC and Stony Brook lipidomics course. Um, in which we um, uh, measured uh, S1P levels by LCMS, and also Dr. Paiying Yang at MD Anderson, who helped us in that respect. Uh, Rick Proria at the NIH, my longstanding collaborator. Uh, Jonathan Smith at Cleveland Clinic for atherosclerosis models. Ralph Adams for many mouse models. I talked about uh, Bjorn Dahlbeck and his collaborators in Scandinavia for APOM collaboration, and Arita Di Lorenzo at Wild Cornell for, um, for the blood pressure studies and nit nitric oxide studies with a postdoc, Anna Cantalupo, uh, Natalie Berg, and Yi Zhang at um, Wild Cornell. It's also involved in uh, barrier functions and other um, uh, staff members from my lab, uh, Yuhi Sano, uh, former postdoc, and Andrian Cartier, the current postdoc, uh, and also acknowledge the funding sources, uh, NIH, National Heart Lung Blood Institute, and Fondation Le Duc. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hla. I am not sure we have any questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Lee, have you seen any questions? No, I have not received any questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please click on the, uh, raise your hand on the um, control panel. And if, if we have no more questions, um, Let's see. So um, thank you both. And um, this is the end of the webinar. If you have questions, please email info at navbo.org and we'll make sure to share your questions with Dr. Hla and Lee. Oh, there's one question. I... There's a hand oh. raised. Okay. Um. Go ahead, Michelle. Quickly, quickly. Yeah? I don't know. I'm not a scientist, computer scientist. Michelle? Yeah. yeah. I don't think try it's to, auto. Try to unmute. Try to unmute and see. Okay. Okay, so we can talk. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. <laughs> Woo, it's Michelle Bendeck from University of Toronto. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Hi, Michelle. I think the question that I had has already been answered in the latter part of your talk, so I'll ask another question. Um, when you see the vessel stabilization in the angiogenesis scenario, um, you talked a lot about how the S1P modulates endothelial adhesion, focal adhesion. Is there also a role for recruitment and stabilization of pericytes? Uh, yes, uh, I didn't mention that, uh, but in the knockout for S1PR1, if you look at the dorsal aorta, uh, the pericytes uh, do not invest properly. Uh, in other words, you examine those vessels closely, the pericyte adhesion 
to the endothelium is defective. Um, and in those areas where pericytes are not covered in the dorsal aorta, you tend to see hypersprouting. Um, and that process actually can be studied in vitro. So we uh, took endothelial cells and co-cultured them with uh, pericytes or 10 T and a half cells. We can show S1P dependent uh, adhesion of pericytes to endothelial cells. And we also showed that this was dependent on NK adherent. And so that paper was published, but I, I didn't really go through that in the webinar. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jim. I have forgotten about that. I actually, if there are no other questions, I, I can ask my other one because I'm not sure that I know exactly or completely. Um, so when you, in the athro models, and I guess in the MI model as well, um, what's the mechanism for the S1P inhibition of VCAM and ICAM? And does that, is that inhibiting VCAM, ICAM just in the endothelial cells, or is that a broader inhibition of other cell types present in the tissue? We don't know for sure, but we think it's primarily on the endothelium. Um, and we think that the HDL structure is quite important. So um, the S1P signal is important and having the right delivery through the HDL is also important. But we think that the inhibition is primarily in the endothelium. And mediated through that decrease in NF kappa B, is that your thought? Yeah, yeah, we can actually measure like phospho NF kappa B signal after cytokine treatment. And if you incubate with APOM plus HDL, that's attenuated. Uh, Tim, I'm Jeff from Toronto and I've got a question for you. Okay, um, Hi, Jeff. What's, what's the effect of APOM FC on blood pressure? Um, so in a normal, normotensive animals, um, there is a slight decrease uh, for a short amount of time, but that normalizes um, within six hours. Um, and, and that's the dose that we use. Uh, to be honest, we probably need to do much more extensive, you know, dose response studies. But if you do that on a uh, angiotensin-induced hypertensive animals, we see a much more sustained uh, hypotensive effect. I see. So is there an effect on isolated blood vessels then? Is it a vasodilator? Um, in isolated vessels, uh, we've done some very preliminary experiments. Um, and, and these are, you know, probably, probably needs to be repeated more. Uh, but yes, you can see, um, you know, flow dependent, you know, both flow dependent vasodilatation or vasoconstricted vessels. If you titrate with APOMFC containing S1B, you can see uh, dilatation. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so I hope you found this information beneficial. These webinars are brought to you by the NABO Education Committee. Our next webinar will be also from a speaker from the recent Vascular Biology 2018 uh, held in Newport. Please join us on January 10th for a talk by Joshua Hutchison, Florida International University. Please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar or when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know if you, what you thought of the webinar and any topics you may want to see in a NAVBO webinar presentation. I'd like to thank Dr. Hua and Lee again for our wonderful presentation and looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.